Assalamualaikum and salam sejahtera. Welcome to topic 2. With this topic, we'll talk more about the structure of the compilers itself. So, let's start. To understand the significance of compiler, let's discuss a bit about that very powerful chip inside our computers, the CPU. While it can complete billions of operations per second, the type of instruction that it can do is actually very simple. It can do basic arithmetic such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. It can load values, it can move values, and it can compare between two values. A CPU can do very basic tasks, but what about instructions that are more complicated such as if else or array function? or a function itself. Therefore, there must be something in the middle that is able to translate this high level instruction into basic instructions that a CPU can execute. That something is a compiler. Let's look at the definition of compiler. Compiler is a computer software that translates or compiles source code written in a high-level language such as C++ into a set of machine language instructions that can be understood by a digital computer's CPU. This translation comes from Encyclopedia Britannica. Compiler in its most basic definition is a software translator. It translates high-level programming language into low-level programming language such as machine language or assembly language. An important concept in compiler is semantically equivalent. It means that the translation of the original input must have a similar meaning word by word. So for example, I like to eat watermelon, banana, grapes, orange, and pineapple must be translated to Saya suka makan tembikai, pisang, anggur, limau, dan nenas and not Saya suka makan buah-buahan even though the meaning might be similar. Let's discuss some important concepts in compiler. The first four concepts are related to each other. So for example, <clears throat> if I have a program written in Java, so this is calculator dot Java. And then I used a Java compiler for Windows to compile my program and I would get calculator.exe for example. So this is a calculator program that can run on a Windows computer. So now let's take a look at the first four concepts. The first one is called source program. In our example, calculator is our source program because this is our source and the program that we have written is a calculator program. And then let's look at the source language. So the source language is Java because our program is written in Java language. So this is source language. Now let's look at object program. So this is our object, the results of our compilation. So our object program is still calculator. It is a calculator program. And our object language is Windows machine language. Because in order for it to be able to run on a Windows platform, it must be written in Windows machine language. So if you see here, our compiler in the middle 
works as a translator. It simply translates from Java language into Windows machine language. It doesn't change the program itself. So if previously it is a calculator program in the source, as the object, it is still a calculator program, just written in a different language. Next, let's take a look at the remaining four concepts. Okay, the first one is compile time. So compile time is the time taken during the compilation here. So when our Java compiler is compiling calculator.java, the time te taken is called the compile time. Therefore, compile time error is any error detected during compilation. So for example, if you have syntax error, such as missing semicolon, so this is a compile time error. Okay, how about runtime? So runtime is when the compiler is done compiling the program and the calculator.exe is used by user. So our user is using our calculator. So when the user is using this calculator, this is what we call runtime. The compiler is no longer in this situation anymore because the compiler is done with its compilation task. So now the user is using the calculator and this is called a runtime. Therefore, runtime error is any error that is faced by the user when it is using the calculator. So for example, if the user try to divide by zero, so it keys in five divide by zero. So you will get some sort of logic error. So logic error that is faced by the user when it is using or running the object program is called runtime error. When comparing the advantages or disadvantages, we can look at these points. So first, high-level programming languages like Java or C++ are certainly easier to learn than machine language because machine language involves coding in binaries. Next, machine independent. As long as a Java compiler for multiple computers exists, for example, Macintosh, Linux, or Windows, you only need to learn Java language and you can compile your programs on these multiple computers. As finally, high-level programming language um, support abstraction. This makes it more sophisticated because programmer does not have to know how certain functions work. They just need to know how to use it. So for example, um, to display the current date, if you are programming using Java, you can just create an object of class time or class date and um, call the function of today, or if I'm not mistaken. Next, on the minus side, uh, the disadvantages of high-level programming language. First, we don't have complete control. So we cannot decide, for example, at which address we want to put our variable. These are all abstracted for us and decided by the high-level programming language itself. However, if you are doing your programming, using machine language or assembly language, you can actually specify in which memory address you want to store your variable in. Next, because compiler is a translator, it might produce an inefficient translation. Therefore, inefficient machine language may be generated. 
And finally, if we develop our program in Java, for example, we would need a Java compiler to compile it before we can run it. So this is the additional software needed. But if you are writing your program in machine language, you can just simply run your program without needing an additional compiler. Here are some examples of compilers that have been developed. To represent compilers, we have several ways of doing it. A popular way is called a T diagram. So for example, for the first compiler, Java compiler for Apple Macintosh, you can represent it by first drawing the T block and then writing Java because Java is the source language and then Macintosh because Macintosh is the target language it translates from Java to Macintosh and on the bottom part of the T diagram is Macintosh because this particular compiler runs on an a on a Macintosh machines, meaning it is written in Macintosh machine language. So this is a T diagram. However, throughout our syllabus, we will be using a notation called Big C notation. So it is very similar to how T diagram works. So for the first compiler again, uh, we draw the Big C and then this big C is representing compiler. This is a compiler that translates from Java to Macintosh. And it is written in Macintosh machine language. So this is for the first compiler. As for the second compiler, a COBOL compiler for Univac. This is how you represent it in Big C notation. C, the Big C representing compiler, translate COBOL to UNIVAC machine language, and it is written in UNIVAC machine language, or it runs on UNIVAC platform. And for the third compiler, the Big C, Compiler that translates C++ to Tesla machine language, but this compiler runs on Windows. So this is how you represent compilers using Big C notation. The way that compilers translate from high-level programming language to lower level or machine language are in phases. Each phase accepts the output from the previous phase as input and produces its own output. So there are three phases. The first phase is called lexical analysis. The second phase is called syntax analysis. And the third phase is called code generation. So the input to lexical analysis is our high-level programming language uh, source code. For, for example, if you write calculator.java, so your source code will become the input to lexical analysis. And then um, lexical analysis will produce output. It becomes the input for syntax analysis. The output of syntax analysis becomes the input of code generation. And finally, uh, the code generation phase will produce as output our machine language program. So this is, um, it will be calculator.exe, for example. So uh, if it is executable on a Windows platform. Now let's take a look at a further breakdown of all the, the three phases of compilers and what exactly the uh, each of these phases will do. So just like we mentioned in the previous slide, our input of the compiler or the, or the first phase of the compiler is lexical analysis. In the lexical analysis, the compiler will categorize words from strings and as output, uh, it will get 
the streams of tokens. So what this basically means, if you have something like integer y equals to 5, so the compiler will try to categorize each of this word uh, and determine it belongs into which category. So for example, an integer might be a keyword y is an identifier this assignment operator this equal sign is an assignment operator 5 is a um, num number or numerical values uh, a numeric constant and finally semicolon is a special character next um, it will produce as output the streams of tokens so streams of tokens are basically uh, all these words that have been categorized the output of lexical analysis will then becomes the input of the second phase, which is syntax analysis. So in syntax analysis, our compiler will check for proper syntax. In the previous phase, lexical analysis, um, syntax would not be checked. So for example, if you have something um, that is obviously wrong in syntax, um, like y class divide or something the lexical analysis phase will still categorize each of these tokens so this can be categorized as identifier this is categorized as keyword and this is categorized as an arithmetic operator because it will not check for proper syntax yet in the lexical analysis phase. However, in the second phase of syntax analysis, compiler will check for proper syntax. So if you have something like this, it will be rejected. So it will uh, the compiler will issue an error message, a helpful error message, for example, semicolon expected at line 72. And if there is no error, to your program, the syntax analysis phase will determine your program structure. So there are two types of program structure that are possible. So the first one is called atoms or at and the second one is called syntax tree. So atoms and syntax tree are two ways of representing our program. Uh, so I would like to give some examples. So if you have uh, y equals to a plus b, so this will be represented in the form of atoms like this. At a and b store into t1 and then move t1 to y. So this is atoms. As for syntax tree, the same uh, line of program will be represented like this. So y equals to a plus b. Okay, so the output of syntax analysis becomes the input of the third phase, which is code generation. So the code generation in the code generation phase, it will simply translate the structure of the program either in the form of atoms or syntax tree into machine language. So it's either a binary or in our particular syllabus, we will be using assembly language. So this output will then be able to run on the targeted machine or architecture.